Sambonani, good evening. I hope you guys are all well. Just gonna check that the lighting is a bit better. Ha! There we go. I hope this live feed will carry and will behave. Um, I'd like to speak for a bit longer than I've been speaking lately. I know some of you that have been following me since the beginning of the year and even before that know that I can go, boy. <laughs> I can speak for an hour, hour and a half on my own. And because of YouTube, because of attention capital, because uh, of my live feeds that I've been getting disturbed, uh, I've had to cut down to like 10 minutes, 15 minutes max. But I want to go a bit harder to, tonight. And for anyone who's going to be watching this whenever I, whenever they get a chance to see it. Three days ago, I was asked, what was the question? I was asked how this country sustains itself. And the conversation became about tax, basically. The way I explained it then, I thought it was really nice. I wish someone could have been filming me. And maybe as time goes by, I'm going to try and get people that can film me um, whenever I'm traveling, whenever I'm having ad hoc conversations in, in decent quality so that um, I can connect or so that you guys can hear me just in my natural state. South Africa is a piece of land. Piece of land, obviously, continents and whatever pieces of land. It's a unique piece of land because it has, it has been identified and uh, marked, demarcated off with what we call borders. We've all decided, the colonialists did it, but even to this day, we have become complicit in agreeing that, sure, this is South Africa, this is our home, it goes up to there, up to there. Once you get to this part, it's called Lesotho. Once you get here, it's called the Swatin. Once you get that side, it's called Namibia. Once you get there, it's Botswana. Once you get there, it's Mozambique, um, etc., etc. This is South Africa. And from where it was before colonialists got here to where it is today, a lot of development work has happened. The building of the highways, of roads, the building of infrastructure such as dams. A dam is a man-made body of water. Um... Bridges, of course, uh, train tracks, our railway system. The day we get good leadership, good strong leadership in this country, maybe a dictator, our railway, our railway system will be revived and it will be a huge boost to our economy, by the way. It was built so that it could make the economy run more efficiently. But with the democratic government that came in, a lot of greed came in and the railway system kind of fell apart. And today we see all these trucks on the road. The railway system, we obviously see hospitals, we see a lot of schools, um, we see buildings, whether it is for business, whether it is for government, um, we see developed parks, you know, could be a zoo, could be the Kruger National Park, it could be some other space that people get to enjoy, um, what else? But all the development that you see in this country from before the colonizers came to where we are now, they've happened. A big chunk of them have been funded by the government, of course. Government has a budget every single year. And that budget is normally announced by the Minister of Finance. And then they explain, or they are meant to explain, where the money came from and where the money is going. A lot of people, of course, say things like, yeah, but I pay tax. And they say that, but they don't really know the numbers and they don't really know how much tax they pay. And they don't know how much benefit they get that is not from their tax as well. I'm going to try to simplify it as quickly as I possibly can. Um, I'm not going to give you actual numbers because I don't think actual numbers are important. I'm going to give you estimates. But not estimates. I'm going to give you hypothetical, imagined figures. To run this country every year costs 2 trillion rands. 2 trillion is... Uh, a million is 6 zeros. A billion is 9 zeros. A trillion is 12 zeros. So 2 trillion rand. 2... What's 12? 2 million million <laughs> uh, rands to run this country. Where does the government get the money to run this country? They get it, of course, from tax. Um, maybe let me stop at tax for a bit. The three major sources of tax in this country are personal income tax. Personal income tax is pay as you earn, payee, that a lot of you guys will see maybe on your pay slip that you normally pay in something called provisional tax. 
You don't have to pay tax every month. For people that don't understand tax, you won't know that. You can pay your tax once at the end of the year. The reason you do it every month is so that it's easier to manage. Come the end of the year when you have to submit your return, then there's like a reconciliation, a recon, where they see if you overpaid or if you underpaid based on how much they thought you were going to make that year. And then obviously you can reduce your deductions. Deductions are, are taxable deduct or tax allowable deductions, amounts that you can minus <laughs> to help you pay less tax. I don't really want to go into tax. Personal income tax is the biggest source of revenue in this country. The second one is corporate or company income tax, which is currently charged at 28%. 28% after you've deducted your business expenses. Not a lot of companies pay it. A lot of you guys have got companies registered at the CIPC. Hey, my CK form. Hey, Penelin Richie Steele. Um, but you guys probably don't file returns even. Just CIPC returns. A lot of you don't file financial statements to the CIPC. A lot of you don't have companies that are probably worth taxing. So very few. If I'd argue maybe a couple of hundreds, if I was to guess, maybe 500 companies in this country actually pay corporate income tax or at least a decent amount of it. The rest pay very minimal tax, 28%. Depending on your, if you have a micro enterprise, a small business, there's other tax rates as well, a bit more technical. With the personal income tax, last I checked, I actually haven't been looking at the tax tables recently. Um, you need to be earning 6,700 Rand a month or more. 6,700 Rand, I think 6,750 or something like that. Every month or more for you to be eligible to pay personal income tax. If you earn under 6,750, you're not eligible to pay income personal income tax. So the average worker in South Africa earns 3.5, 3.6. The, the median, like the average middle income in this country is 3.5, 3.6. Um, the top 10% earns 7,300 rand or more per month. So you can see that's the top 10 and up. So arguably about 80% to 90% of people that work, not even talking about South Africans as a whole, just the people that work are not paying personal income tax because they do not meet the threshold to be liable for personal income tax. So come end of the year, if there was any tax that was paid on their behalf and they submit their IRP5, which is a document that you send to the South African Revenue Services to help them check your different sources of income, you will then get a tax refund because you're not meant to be paying tax according to the tax tables. Corporate income tax, 28%. Sorry, those are people that don't pay, pay tax. From the people that pay, last I checked, 18% at the lowest level. At the highest level, it's 45%. I'm not sure of the tax bracket and where it starts. I don't even want to guess. I don't even want to guess. Those of you that know the amount, you can write them down. If you don't know them, you can go Google them. I'll maybe speak about it sometime when I get technical about tax. If you're earning, let's call it 100,000 a month, you're going to get taxed at 45%, which means, <laughs> which means 45,000 Rand is going to go to SARS and you only keep 55,000. 100,000 a month, 45,000, boom. South African Revenue Services uh, to pay for tax, to take care of poor people. You know, we've got a sliding scale um, tax um, system. So obviously if you earn less, you pay less, 18% at the highest levels, like I said, 45%. Corporate income tax, 28%. And then the other big tax collection base is value added tax. That is VAT, which is charged at 15% on goods that you buy. Not all goods attract VAT. There's a list. I don't know if it's 19 or more goods, what they normally call basic goods. And they do this because they, they know poor people shouldn't be paying unnecessary tax. Brown bread, white bread, I think pastas, tin foods, um, I think cooking oil. I could be wrong. Uh, fruits and vegetables. There's a list, there's a long list. You can go on the SARS website or you can even just Google. Um, goods that do not at attract VAT or that attract zero <laughs> VAT. It's unnecessary tax terms, but basically you don't pay VAT on those goods. But for everything else, you can pay VAT. Bank charges, if you're paying rent somewhere, if you're buying a car, um, if you're buying clothing somewhere, you want to see on your receipt, on your slip. If you ever look at it when you buy your groceries, you will see that there's an amount there for VAT. 
And if you've ever paid attention to those numbers, if you go to a pick and pay shop right Woolworth Spa and you look at that list, let's say. Sorry, sorry, I thought we were doing well and my Facebook is reconnecting. I hope this won't be ongoing. We'll hope for the best. Where was I? If you go through your slip, pick and pay, spa, shop right, woolies. If, for example, you spent a thousand rand for your groceries before VAT, your VAT will not be 150 rand, which is 15%. And that's because some of those goods don't attract VAT. But VAT is 15%. Part of the VAT is charged on fuel and charged on other things as well. That's VAT. Personal income tax, corporate income tax, value added tax. Those are the three taxes that are collected. There's other taxes. Uh, import duties, if you're importing stuff from overseas. There's special taxes on certain things. There's a sin tax on cigarettes, on alcohol goods, um, and other such goods. Um, I think fuel levy might fall as a tax. So if you're buying petrol, you have to pay VAT and you have to pay a fuel levy. I'm not sure of the amount. It might be about 30% of what you're paying. But I know there was a huge uproar when the fuel prices went up. And people were saying, why don't you guys scrap some of these unnecessary payments that we make? Some of the payments when you're pouring fuel go to REF, the Road Accident Fund, and they go to other spaces as well. But I think fuel levies or the fuel levies came up to about 30% on top of the VAT that you also have to pay for fuel. So these are the various taxes that SARS collects. I start off by saying hypothetically 2 trillion rand to run the country for a year. And then these taxes is one of the ways that government raises money. There's 2 million that they need. You might find that the tax comes up to 1.3 trillion rand. 1.3 trillion rand of the 2 trillion rand. So where does the other 700 billion come from? Loans. From overseas, when we speak IMF, World Bank, we saw what happened with the 500 billion rand COVID relief. Some of the money was money from overseas. There are other, the BRICS Bank, other institutions overseas that the South African government loans money from to run the country for infrastructure, to pay for social grants and all those types of things. So foreign debt. <laughs> sure. Anyways, foreign debt is one of them. Uh, another one is what's called retail bonds. Uh, you can go onto the website for retail bonds. I don't know if they're offering 4% return per year, but basically the government loans money from the public, from me and you. There's an amount, a minimum amount, you can buy retail bonds and government will pay you interest at the end of the year for those bonds. And they are protected or the security and the collateral is tax money and other assets owned by the government. You can, as a normal citizen, loan money to the South African government in something called a retail bond. You can go look that up. So that's one of the ways that they raise money as well. Again, these bonds are backed by tax money and other assets owned by the government. Another way that they raise money is state-owned enterprises. So back in the day, apartheid government and the British governments before them, they built up these institutions. And when they built them, they built some of them with the aim of helping society run better and helping the economy and business function smoother. When they built ESCOM, Indrik van der Beel and the boys, when they built ESCOM, they were almost giving out electricity at cost because they were saying, if we can get cheap energy, it's going to be easier to build a first world economy. I mentioned the railway system as an example. They built SASO so that we could refine our own oil and we could create and produce our own petroleum, our petrol and our own fuels that we need to fuel the economy. As an example, of course, we've got the SAPC, uh, which does broadcasting for the government and also for the public. I think we've got 18 radio stations, as an example now, which are free to air. You can listen to them, you go on radio now, you don't have to pay a subscription and you listen to the news, the weather, whatever the case may be. We've got Danel, which has been struggling. They manufacture weapons, meant to be for the country, but I think for other people as well. Which other SOE is important? Transnet, uh, which does our Transnet, sorry, which does our railway, um, Abo Metro Rail, and all those guys. Uh, SAA, which has been sold, the South African Airways. State owned enterprises, we've got a couple of hundred of SOEs. It's just obviously our ESCOM are the most popular ones that are always spoken about. But some of these ones make profit for the government. 
And some of that profit obviously goes to government and adds on to this extra 700 billion that makes up the 2 trillion rand that is used to run this country for one year. That's the money. What did I want to say? So when you pay tax, of course, your tax goes to running. Oh, I know where I'm going. Your tax goes to running, uh, paying social grants, running government hospitals and government clinics, running government schools. 67, 67% of our schools are no fee schools in this country, which means they are quintile one, two, three, fancy education department terms. Basically, the kids don't have to pay school fees there. And the bulk of those schools, the kids get fed as well uh, through a feeding scheme that the government has. Maintaining the roads, building roads, um, building RTPs. I think we have over 5 million RTPs that have been built in this country. Um, setting up funding agencies such as CIFA, the NYDA, the NEF, the IDC, which fund businesses. Um, and then paying salaries, of course. Nurses, teachers, traffic cops, police, administrators that work at the various departments or home affairs, department of labor, etc. And then obviously the members of parliament, other politicians, uh, the ministers and the president, etc. I think salaries from the 2 trillion rand budget come up to about 40%. 40% of the budget goes to just paying salaries. I think I stand to be corrected about 20% of the same budget. When I spoke about loan, when I spoke about loans that the government takes from overseas and through retail bonds and other domestic loans, I think 20% of the budget only pays for interest. It's not paying for the loans, it's just paying for interest on the loans, which is a, a huge problem in this country, and it's one of the things that sunk. Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka became a bankrupt country because the cost to service their debt was too high. They couldn't raise enough money. They weren't making enough money as a, com as a country, as an economy to sustain those things. And the, and the institutions out in the world were like, no more money to you, Sri Lanka. Cheers. That's the one thing. The other thing I was explaining on that day was people don't understand the structures that run this country. I spoke about South Africa being a piece of land. I spoke about developing the land to what we see today. And I wanted to mention that it is because of governments and the spending and the budget every year that we build and we maintain. The maintenance is very important. ESCOM was crushed not because of building, but because of lack of maintenance and lack of expansion. Of course, we see the same with our railway system, especially where people are stealing steel, people are stealing copper wires, whatever, etc. You build, you maintain. Government. The people that run this country are split into three organizations or three groupings. I'm not going to get technical here because I don't know the technicalities, but I, it's just me trying to teach you the little bit that I know. You're free to correct me in the comments. And I'm obviously going to be doing research and I'm going to be learning more and I'm going to keep reminding myself of this information so that we can engage. Government, the judiciary, the state. Again, government the judiciary, the state. These are meant to be three separate organs that run the country. Judiciary is pretty straightforward. The courts, constitutional court, Supreme Court of Appeal, the high courts, the magistrates, regional courts, and then some special courts. We've got courts in this country which run the country legally. And then obviously the judges, the magistrates, the lawyers that run there. That's the judiciary. It is meant to be independent of the state and independent of government. Government sets the laws and then these laws are passed on to the judiciary and then the judiciary is meant to enact these laws. Of course, they can challenge some of these laws and then post them back to government for government to decide to amend whatever the case may be. But the judiciary is meant to be untouched. Chief Justice Raymond Zondo, Chief Justice or ex-Chief Justice Mukhoeng Mukhoeng, Pius Langer and the boys, they are meant to be independent of a president, of ministers, etc. And they mean to be independent of mind and sober in their decisions and they mean to apply the law as set down and following on precedent what has been ruled on before the judiciary that's the one leg the other leg is government government is parliament what you guys see the president deputy president the cabinet ministers the members of parliament and then it filters down you've got the provincial legs where you've got uh, the premier as the head there and then you've got the mecs various portfolios then it goes down to municipal levels where you have mayors, 
and then you have MMCs at that level, and then it goes down to ward councillors. It's a couple of people sitting somewhere there, but that's government. They are meant to devise the laws. They are meant to listen to the people, what's working, what's not working, go sit down, listen to suggestions, draft certain bills, set up green papers and white papers, and then submit them, and then turn them into laws that then get passed on to the judiciary to then enact into the country. Along with that, obviously, they set up these institutions which run the country, the Department of Labor, the Department of Home Affairs, um, various departments, Department of Education, as an example. And then obviously, those departments are meant to make sure that the country is functioning as it should. Of course, they've got things like the police, etc., for security and those things. That's government, it enacts the laws. Then there's the state. <laughs> Again, if I'm wrong, please feel free to correct me. I do not know these things inside out. I haven't study this stuff at varsity. I don't read up on the stuff every week. The state are the people or the structure that are meant to fundamentally do the work on the ground. Government devises the laws, sets up the institutions, collects the tax. Obviously, the laws go to the judiciary and then they meant to then pass it on. Someone's trying to call me. Sorry. Then they meant to pass it on to the state and then the state is meant to do the work. The state is the police, the clinics, the hospitals. Um, I mentioned the police, maybe the soldiers. Um, all the administrators that run the country on behalf of the government. This is what's important now. The state is meant to be independent. It is not meant to be that, ah, oh, you are voted for as the ANC to sit in government. And that's why today you work at home affairs. It should not matter who you vote for which political party you are affiliated with, when you work for the state, that should not matter. It's the same way I can vote ANC, DA, EFF, Action SA, PA. It shouldn't matter when I go work for ABSA, for Standard Bank, uh, Ernst & Young, PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, Edward Norton Rose, Cliff Decker. It shouldn't matter. It should not matter who I vote for politically and my political ideologies once I work for a certain company. The state is meant to be the same. You're a police officer that is meant to have applied and on merit gotten the job. It shouldn't matter who you vote for. I'm in Mukongo laws. I did not somebody EFF. Ah, no, I'm with the DA. It should not matter because you're working for the state. That's one of the reasons why people get upset with this thing that they call CADA deployment. CADA deployment is when you get voted in government to look after, edit, whatever, amend the laws. And then after that, you didn't dispense people to go and work in the state because they are part of your political party. It's not meant to work like that. The state is meant to be independent. Very important. So I wanted to mention those things as well. But when the tax money is collected, that 40% that I spoke about pays for government workers, pays for people that work in the judiciary, and it pays for people that work for the state. For interest, a president, I'm not sure about a deputy president, but a president receives their salary. For the rest of their life. President Jacob Zuma or ex-president Jacob Zuma is still earning his presidential salary. Whatever Cyril Ramaphosa is earning this year, Jacob Zuma is going to earn this year. Tabombegi, ex-president Tabombegi is going to earn this year. Not sure about Khalima Mutlante, but he might be earning as well. And if he was still alive, uh, Nelson Mandela. Before he passed away, F.W. de Klerk, ex-president F.W. de Klerk, was also receiving a presidential salary. salary. They received that until the day they die. Judges in this country, I think we have over 200 judges. Judges in this country, even if they have, they have officially retired, earn their judge salary until the day they die. Very, very important things for you guys to know. There's a whole lot of other things we don't know about this country and how it's run. I know, for example, there's a refugee grant that comes from our tax or our budget. I told you there's tax, there's SOE, there's loans that we get. There might be some other revenue sources as well that they raise. Um... But yeah, there's, there's a grant for refugees and there's a grant for other people that are in this country that maybe are not South African citizens, as an example. And then obviously some of the money that's raised in the budget goes to bailing out. We used to bail out SAA. We bail out generally the SAPC every year. We've been bailing out ESCOM. I don't know. I think Andre the Reiter managed to take the debt down from 400 billion to maybe 350 or 300 billion rand. Again, some of it is from government uh, bailouts. Some of it is from government standing as security a surety for ESCOM to go and loan money from overseas as an, a state-owned enterprise, what we call a 
parastatal. So yeah, that was just meant to be a quick breakdown on how this country is run, where your tax money goes, etc. Some of you think that your tax is everything, but it's not. And at some point, it would be nice to be able to quantify the benefits that you get from the budget versus how much tax that you pay. It's very easy for a poor person. A poor person doesn't pay any tax. So for them, it's zero. They might negligible pay a little bit of VAT. Maybe if I eat dawa and matanduk pema, they might pay some syntax. You know, and maybe mabe kibela ma taxi. Some of the taxi fare goes to the fuel levy and VAT through that. But generally, you look at the fact that they have an RTP. The RTP might be worth 200,000. So if it's worth 200,000, they're getting the equivalent of maybe 2,000 rand free rent every month. That's money they're getting. They maybe are on chronic medications. And if you look at the equivalent of that medication, plus the nurse that's helping, plus a doctor that sees them, they might be getting 500 rand to 1,000 rand of medical assistance for free. Their kids are studying at a school and the budget for that might be 1.5 for their child per year. And the child eats at school every day. And some of these schools, they give the kids school uniform as well. Some give them tablets. Last I checked, some were getting bicycles. Some get free transport, bus from home to school as well. So the child might be getting benefits every month. Um, they might have children that are on NSFAS, which means those kids and the NSFAS, it's obviously a loan, but it gets converted into a grant, a free grant that you don't have to pay back if you pass well, converts into like a bursary. So the kids might be on NSFAS. So you might find that a person who is poor might be getting the equivalent of 5,000, 10,000 rand in value per month from the budget, tax money and money from elsewhere. Then you look at the middle class as an example. Of course, they have medical aid. They send their kids to public schools where they pay school fees. So you find that even the money that come from government is sort of negligible, sort of really negligible. So they pay for those things and they're like, but I'm not getting any benefit from my tax, but they do drive on the roads. Um, some of the electricity that we use or that we pay for is subsidized as an example. And there may be some other benefits. Your kids might be on NSFAS. You might find that you have a business and you're middle class and you've gotten funding. Maybe you've gotten a grant from the NYTA. Maybe you've gotten funding from the GEP in Gauteng or from the NEF as an example. And there may be some other benefits that you may not really see that you get. And you might get the equivalent of 500, 1,000, 2,000 rand of benefit every month. And then the rich, of course, get a lot of benefits. You know, they get certain tax cuts from government, depending on maybe the, they're running business in a specific zone. Um, they might get benefits from the people who, who they employ. They might get subsidies because they're farmers or they're in manufacturing or because they export. You know, a lot of people attend conferences and, and, and workshops and seminars that are done by the Department of Agriculture or the Department of Labor or the Department of Social Development and they eat for free. That's money that comes from tax and from the budget. meatballs and finger foods. That's a department. Getting lanyards and you're getting goodie bags. A lot of that is, is money from the budget. Maybe you guys were transported, whatever the case may be. The Department of Sports, uh, Arts and Culture with Unatim Teto. Some of the funding of athletics, soccer. You might find that there's a free parks. Uh, department of I don't know if I don't know if I don't know what the department is, but there's parks uh, and gardens in this in this country. The maintenance so that your kids can go play sports field, some of the tournaments, etc. All of that comes from money from the budget. And you might be like, I don't get any money from the government just because you're looking at an RTP and a grant. That's not the end of where the money goes. The more we become politically literate, the more we understand where our money goes, who it goes to, how it works. Um, I think the better we will understand what it takes to run a country, the more we will hopefully desire to become politically active. And then you will start understanding the value of your vote. Then you will start understanding the value of your tax. Then you will understand if you maybe hold retail bonds, why we maybe have certain alliances with certain countries, why we maybe don't want certain loans from a World Bank and IMF, why we maybe don't like certain economic policies set by the World Economic Forum, why we have certain issues with the United Nations, the World Health Organization, why we have issues with billionaires in this country and the decision that they make and the politicians that they fund, why we maybe have to relook nationalization. Maybe we should nationalize land and all the big billionaires should lease from government. Instead of maybe paying tax, it's like pay a lease. The land belongs to the state and with that money that you're paying, 
we will collect all this money that you're paying us as a lease for the land that belongs to the people. And then we'll use that land to develop and build roads and upgrade the, the railway system and make sure that the people are being upskilled and can become contributors to the nation. Maybe we need to nationalize the mines. If you look at what's happening in the United Arab Emirates, the people there generally don't work. They actually have to beg foreigners to come and work and teach there. And they pay the foreigners because the people there are living lavish of oil money because they have a monarch there that does good work for them. Once we understand some of these things, we can then be able to fundamentally be able to pitch these to government, to our ward councillors, to our municipalities, our mayors, to our premiers, our MECs, to our members of parliament, to our ministers. And we can dictate to them because they are meant to be public servants. They are not meant to dictate to us like some kings that were born somewhere or some people that conquered a tribe somewhere or some people that ran a coup and are rebel soldiers. They are meant to take directive from us in this country. We claim to have a constitutional democracy, but it seems a lot of the people are politically inactive because they are politically illiterate. And some of us want you guys to learn these things so that when we have these conversations, you guys understand and you understand why it is unsustainable to keep giving people grants. Why it is stupid to look at the schooling system we have now and realize that it is destroying children and it is not building them. It is not teaching kids how to manage money. It is not teaching kids how the tax system works. It is not teaching kids how the banking system works and the South African Reserve Bank, which is privately owned, which is ridiculous. It is not telling our children how to work the land, to grow food, to develop the land so that it's fertile and arable. It's not teaching the kids where our water comes from, our water sources, and how precious water is and why you mustn't just open taps and think it's fine to play around in the water and waste it. Develop the land, build property, how to mine. Um, for those of you who maybe follow the virtual Mkuku, especially the new virtual Mkuku channel, I'm sitting there with a mate of mine, Siabule Langanga, who is in mining. And he explains the different, different type of mining uh, models that you can use. Um, what is it called? Open? Ah, what are these terms now? Ah, I forgot the terms, but please go watch it. Siabule Langanga, the virtual Mkuku. But he speaks about the different types of mining. Everyone thinks mining is just digging into the ground. Uh, open shaft, what's it called? Ugh, whatever it is, that there's different types of mining. As an example, kids don't know how to mine. They don't know the value of mining. They don't know where resources go. They don't understand import and export. They don't understand manufacturing. Are we rebuilding our factories as a country? Are we ex exporting to other nations? Why it is important for every single South African to work? You can't be sitting waiting for government. Our government is building a dependent state. Um, I mean, he said that in a couple of interviews he did recently. We are building a dependency society where people are like zombies waiting for government to feed them, to wipe their ass, to give them medication, to send their kids to school, to give their kids job, jobs, to give them good jobs themselves. Uh, government is the biggest employer in the country with over 1.3 million people that work for government. They're waiting for government to give them housing subsidies. They're waiting for government to give them pensions when they're old. No, you need to work. We all need to work and it can't be that we worship government. Government is meant to serve us to create an enabling environment so that we can work. We can build industry. We can have support functions. The state is meant to be a support function to enterprise. Hear me again. The state, the police, the traffic cops, the teachers, the nurses are meant to be a support function for enterprise. Teachers are meant to develop kids that can grow up and come and work in private in the private sector for enterprise nurses are meant to heal sick people that maybe got hurt in a mine or on a farm the police are meant to protect people that are going to to and from work if you look at what government is doing with the ports with the airports with the harbors with the railway system it is meant to be a support function so that if i'm digging in a mine or if i have a farm i can put my stuff on a train it can get to richards bay or to durban and i can send it to china or I can send it to Korea or to Japan or we can send it to the Americas or to Europe so that we can bring foreign currency into this country and build this country into a great nation. But we've lost it because our politicians care about money. A lot of them are not leaders. A lot of them are not politically literate. Some of these things I'm telling you now, some of your ministers don't know. They don't know because they're not politically literate. They sit there... Uh, I'm a sleepist. They're sleeping there. They don't read policies. 
They've got director generals, I'm a DG, that do a lot of their work while they prance around attending a conference, being driven in blue, blue lights, eating finger foods, being called ma'am and sir, and, and making a lot of noise with their political parties and fighting over positions and then giving tenders to their friends. A lot of their friends, and I want to speak to black tenderpreneurs in particular, a lot of these black tenderpreneurs do not have a builder mindset. They want to take money, wear Gucci, wear Prada, wear Louis Vuitton, take their girlfriends, their boyfriends to Dubai, um, buy, buy, buy bottles and, and loan them money at clubs, buy fancy cars, uh, double exhaust, and live in fancy houses. But they don't have a builder mindset to build this nation. As a, as a black tenderpreneur, what have you built? Have you at least, do you at least fund a soccer tournament in your Yokasi? Which I, uh, there's a soccer tournament I fund. So some of the talent that has been found in this country is from, is from the boys that I, I funded in my tournament. Have you built a private clinic or donated money to the public clinic for resources? Like say, as a tenderpreneur, I just want to take some of my profits and get some of the boys here to buy lawn mowers so that they're always cutting the grass here. I want to donate some paint so that you guys can paint some of the schools here, just with some of my profits. What are you guys doing with your profits to build society? You guys leave Ekasi, you go and you become tenderpreneurs, and then you go and live at Waterfall, at Stain City, Mshana, places in Cape Town, because we need to see you but you're not going back to build Ekaslago. And then it blows your mind why your cast is falling apart, why kids are smoking nyaupe, why everyone is, is drugged up and is, is living on alcohol, Uchuala has become like a drip that keeps them sustained. Of course, it doesn't go through the veins, it goes through their mouth, but they're living on a trip just so that they numb the reality and the misery of their existence. Because you guys are not responsibly taking your profits and plowing back. Stellenbosch was built by white businessmen and white tenderpreneurs. They may have gotten tenders corruptly, fraudulently from the party government, but they took that money and they built up their schools. They built up their churches. They built up private health care. They have got security. They've got beautiful neighborhoods where they come from. They've built farms and other enterprises. Black business people, black, black tenderpreneurs are not going to build the spaces that they come from. And that's something that needs to be fixed. At the very least, even if you live in the suburbs as a black businessman and a black tenderpreneur, take that money and make sure that you're donating some to the local school, to the local church to the local healthcare facilities. See where spaces are, where the grass is not cut, where you need some neighborhood watch. That's what Afri Forum has done. Majorly white Afrikaans people, they pay tax, they go to work, they run businesses, they donate to charities, they donate to the church, and then they take some of their money and they put it into Afri Forum so that Afri Forum can deliver basic services and build uh, skills institutions such as Soltech for the benefit of their people. And I've said before, these other unions, these other teachers' unions, or Satu, or Noomsa, or Noom, what are they doing with their monies? They invest them and then uh, I'm a shop steward and these trade leaders, after that, after they step down from their positions, all of a sudden they sit on the board of a company as the BEE partner and they're rich. They haven't built anything of substance that we can see. With that private schooling chain is actually owned by this union or it's owned by those black tenderpreneurs they built the schooling chain shout out to Sizwe Masana and his wife Dr. Judy Lamini who have built future nation schools Sizwe Masana is a CA Dr. Judy I think is a medical doctor she was the chairperson of uh, Aspen Pharmacare I slash Aspen all the time Stephen Saad in them I believe they fund politicians from Jacob Zuma to Otamumbe to Cyril because they had a monopoly on ARVs at some point They've got a monopoly on COVID vaccines currently. So it's whatever that relationship is. But the bottom line is they've done good work. And Dr. Judy Lamini was involved as the chairperson there. Sizwe, Sizwe Masana opened the first black auditing firm, Sizwe & Co., which became Sizwe & Saluba, which became Sizwe & Saluba Koboto, SNG. You know, he's built, um, they've got, they named it after their son. They've got a company that is named after their late son that passed on. But part of that, I think it was fees on my son. Part of that was the schooling group that they have, Future Nation Schools. They've built a private schooling leg as their contribution to society. They pay tax, they create jobs. Uh, CISO has worked in government, I think, under telecom. 
They had a very short stint as the head of NS Fas. <laughs> he probably saw how much filth and politics is there and he decided to get out. But these are black business people that are giving back. Patrice Mutsipe, who I also bash all the time, uh, obviously has set up the Mutsipe Foundation, which does charity work. He contributes a lot to his Sundowns and what Sundowns has become as a super footballing club. Um, he donates to the churches, the big churches in the country. There's times when he passes them all to a stadium, you know, for them to come together and unite, etc. At a large scale. But as a young tenderpreneur, yes, but you do make profits of 50,000 a month. Of that 50,000, I'm asking you to take 5,000. 5,000 and, and build something in your community. Go find a machi, and maybe go buy steel poles so that they have soccer posts. Go buy them a kit. Go buy them uh, soccer balls. Buy, buy, go buy kids um, cameras so that they can film content. Go set up a space for free Wi-Fi close to your old home. But like I say, guys, for education, Wi-Fi. If you find out there are people like us that are teaching if you find out there are people in Ekaslako that are teaching extra maths, extra science, extra accounting, go and fund them. Be like, do you guys need money? Do you need a math desk? Do you need a stationery? Do you need to buy more of a physicam, a study and master, a Pythagoras? Where can I help to build this nation? One of the things um, when I said to Rutu Tuzani yesterday, and I've been speaking to him for the past couple of weeks, if not months, I want us as a nation to do this thing of planting trees and makas, especially fruit trees. But trees, just trees, so that we have trees. So if you have a bit of money, plant trees and be like, Ikaslam has got trees, there's shade, kids sit under the trees and they get to play because I, I invested in that. Community gardens, Ikaslam, have donated spades, forks, watering cans, seeds, seedlings, uh, nets to cover, poles, so that my community can have their own vegetables and fruits. And I build a thriving community. It can't be that the only money we're making is from us fighting with each other here. We need to build a strong nation so that one day we're fighting with the world at large. It's like competing the sharks versus the stormers versus the lions. Or Keza Chiefs versus Pirates versus Amazulu versus Ajax. That's nice. But at some point we have to unite into a Bafana Bafana, a Banyana Banyana, a Proteas, a Springboks and compete with the world. When are we going to unite as business people, as enterprise, as a nation and say, look, our, our communities are like Stellenbosch, they're like Mishanga, they're like Camps Bay, they're like Santon. We have uplifted or Alex, Kwamash, I was at Kwamash yesterday. We've uplifted Kwamash, Matatin, Osizwen, Amanyamakazi, Gokwakwa, Kuguletu, Kailicha. You know, those, we've uplifted those places. Now it's time for us to compete with the world because everyone here is mathematically inclined, scientifically inclined, business inclined. We are politically, legally, financially literate. We are hardworking. We are enterprising people. We have an engineer mindset of problem solving. And we become assets around the world. And everyone wants us to come and develop their nations on their behalf. That's the work that we should be doing. Anyways, that's what I wanted to speak about. I don't know how long I've been speaking for. I hope you guys have had a great day. Uh, I was in Durban and I want to thank everyone who was in Durban supporting me to all the panelists that came through Florida Road uh, at Teguin, uh, at Starbucks. Uh, thanks to Muzi Dube there for the connect. And then Kwa Vuyani, Vuyani Store, Kwa Mashua E, where we were there yesterday evening. Shout out to Tutuzane Zuma, Uzi uh, Pomshong that I met with, Ryan that I met with as well, Lakin uh, Timane that I met with. We had a really, really great session yesterday. A lot of stimulating conversations. Tutuzani Zuma says we need to consider water as the next crisis in this country after electricity. Of course, we need to sort out the energy electricity issue, but we need to focus on water. A lot of people are destroying our water pathways and that's something we need to shine a spotlight on. He is doing a lot of community work on the ground and is hoping to inspire more people. Shout out to my boy, Commanders. Commanders, morning. Shout out to Nkantla Lux and the work they're doing with Soweto Parliament. Soweto. Shout out to Ian Cameron and Action Society and the work that they're doing. Shout out to Gates and McKenzie and the Patriotic Alliance in the Central Karoo and the work that they're doing. I'm looking to mention more names of especially young people that are doing work in their communities. With Penn, this is what we're doing. We've built community gardens. Please come through and meet up with us and see the work that we're doing. Come and document, come and shoot the stuff so that when you're sitting with DJ Spoo and the virtual Kuku, you speak about 
excel at this work that's being done in that place. Come and sit with us in this area and see the school that we've built. The school has become clean. The community is involved. We've set up a shop at the school so that the parents buy from the shop. So that we take the money or the profits from the shop to pump into the school. Come look at the work that we're doing with churches. We have combined the churches together and with the, the tithes of Nigel that we give, we've taken some of this money, we've set up a small business fund. So people in the churches that have small businesses, they come and they pitch like Dragon's Den. And we've got some of the people in the church who are corporates, uh, that sit as a panel and they decide who gets funding and who doesn't in the church. And the church has got its own garden and the church once a month has got a flea market where people come with their stalls and they sell things and we trade amongst ourselves as a church. Panel, these are the Pakistanis we're sitting with and we're finding out, guys, oh my friend, how can we get involved with you guys, the Bangladeshis, the Somalis, the Ethiopians? How can you guys become active members of the society, of, of the community? It can't just be that you're coming to milk money from us and then send it to Bangladesh and Somalia and wherever you come from. You need to reinvest this money here. Yes, we can understand some of it you need to send back home because you're struggling, but you also need to contribute to our community. Don't just come and milk us here and not give back. Give back and become members, active members of the community. And Ben, we want you to come and see all my friends that have become our real friends, that we chill with and we speak to, or Abdul, Abu Ahmed and those guys that we're working with in our communities to build something better. These are all the trees we've planted. Oh, we need funding for trees, but these are the people that are going to be taking care of the trees. We need to work. We need to be speaking about things like the 350 SRD grant, Social Relief, Relief for Distress. Is it buying shovels? Is it buying forks? Is it buying seeds? Is it buying chickens? Is it buying fences so we can put chicken runs? For some communities, are we using those monies to buy goats, to buy sheep, to buy cows, to buy feed for pigs? What are we doing? What work are we doing? I want to meet more young people, old people as well, that have put their hands up and are saying, Pen, I want to work. I want to work. Tell me what I need to do. Tell me who I can connect with. Or I'm already working. Please help me. Uh, by the way, a uh, good friend of mine, Lisekho Modise of Buntu Foods, is going down to Yachars Fontein this weekend. There was a dam that burst in Yachars Fontein. Over 300 residents are currently homeless. One person died. A lot of people were injured. Old clothes, second-hand clothes, um, tinned foods, shoes. If you can donate some money, there's three people that have donated money uh, through the Mamsi Foundation, which is my NPO, which I'm going to be sending to the guys there. Um, Milly meal, rice, whatever we can do to go and help those people. I hate charity. Hate it. I prefer giving someone a leg up, giving them a way to feed themselves. But that was a tragedy. Like the floods, Guazu. That was a tragedy that they could not have budgeted for and they currently stranded. So for people that are able to help, you can contact me via my DM. Uh, you can contact me via my email address. You can get it via DM as well. And let's see if there's any little thing that we can do. I know the company there that is currently being investigated as potentially responsible uh, has put up 20 million rand to try and help those families. So we can also do something. And also when we do something, they can see what you know, they are kind Samaritans in South Africa that are willing to help us. Nati one day when they need our help. As Yachar Fontaine will say, guys, thanks for helping us. It's our turn to help you as well. That is how we build better families, communities, a better nation. Outside of politics, outside of big business, a lot of these guys are squabbling on their own. 